This giant box can split my voice into five parts, send that out to five radio towers, and somehow that goes out all over St. Louis in a clear radio signal. I have some questions. Why does this box even exist? Why would you want to split up someone's voice into five parts? And where even are we? We are at radio station WSDZ in Belleville, Illinois, and there's some amazing stuff to see at this site. So this, uh, this tower site, I see there's a DX50 here, and you said Yay. that there's, uh, there was some history with that at Cam Wex too. Yes, kept us on the air from the like, late mid 70s or somewhere in there all the way through till uh, 2005 or six. And this could do 50 kilowatts, but this one's not doing that, right? It is a 50, but it's doing 20 uh, as per the license. And I see that there's a giant pipe, looks like a copper water pipe, but that's not what it is, coming across. That, that is not a water pipe. From there to this gargantuan thing. Yeah. Can you explain why, like, uh, the engineer for this place wanted us to come and see this because it's so different. With yes. Camwex, you just have the transmitter, it went out to the tower, and that's it. It's really right. simple. Yeah, sort of simple, but it's, <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is what you build when you don't have one tower, but you have not two or three or four or five or six or seven, but you have eight towers and two patterns. You have a day pattern and a night pattern. So the day pattern is your big one in AM. That's the one that you usually get the most coverage from. And then your night pattern is what you do to stay legal at night and not interfere with other people. So, so you why, two, why two would you patterns. need that? Like KMOX, you just blast it out, right? Yeah, KMOX, lucky. They have a license that allows them to, direct, to uh, transmit 50 kilowatts day and night. Uh, the coverage at night goes crazy, of course. But if somebody turned on an 1120 somewhere else in the country at night, it would interfere with KMOX, even in St. Louis. So that's where the directional at night comes in, so they don't radiate energy towards St. Louis. So this, this box has two big sections to it. <laughs> it does. And I noticed the day section is a bit bigger. Yeah, the day section, common point day section, and then the night section. So they use a certain set of towers at, in the daytime and a certain set at night. What this part does inside the building is it takes the feet of the transmitter and splits it out proportionately to each tower to create the pattern that's legal. So each tower has a set of settings to allow the legal transmission in, that, in the different directions uh, based on how you tune it and how much energy gets to the tower and what phase it's at in relation to the reference tower. And I, I noticed there's a bunch of little hand cranks. Is there an engineer that comes out here and cranks all those all the time? Yeah, every, every couple of weeks you gotta come out and crank them all to get the energy stored so it runs and you come back out later. I don't no, know if that's true. <laughs> no, that is not true. These are all, uh, the, all of these are particular readings. I can see this is the phase to tower eight during the day. And you got power to tower eight during the day. So as you're turning these, you're, you're actually changing, the, you're shifting the uh, parameters to the tower, which is not exactly to the tower because there's also a tuning unit at the tower. But you're deciding here how much of the total energy goes out and what phase it leaves at in relation to the common pointer and how, how much off phase it is and what the level is. So do you just have this memorized in your head like all the different phases for different tower arrays? Yeah, no, at eight towers you definitely have to write those babies down. And luckily, you know, now all these are recorded. Uh, there's devices that uh, monitor. So every tower has a monitoring uh, system, brings it back into the building where the engineer can monitor remotely or on site, monitor the tower readings to get the phase and the uh, current to each tower. And is that something that you have to work with the FCC on or do you just pick whatever you want? Well, it all starts with those guys that are the, the wizards of design of AM antenna systems, which there are a few in these days, obviously, because it's not the new nice thing. And I'd like to say that their skills are also have been picked up and used by other industries, but they have to go in and figure out first what a legal pattern could be like everyone would say, oh, look, St. Louis, there's a lot of people, so I want this to bend and cover St. Louis, come up and cover what else it can and come back. So those decisions are all given to an engineer who designs what could be built at the site. So in this case, the guy said, you can go to 20 kilowatts and have this coverage that goes way to the north, and you could do that, uh, but you have to have eight towers. So a lot of guys would gasp just at that, right? Eight towers, I'm gonna build eight towers, maintain eight towers, ABC Disney owned it, and built this, and at the time, it was a great investment. So really, do, do these have to be changed ever, or? Uh, well, over time, they have to be adapted. And I'm guessing that if you had a, a component blow right now, some of those 
big capacitors and inductors. You can make the inductors yourself and get them really close and slide along, but a lot of the capacitors you can't. So there could be times when your capacitance is a little different and you're gonna replace one and you're gonna tweak that in. Uh, and, and I don't know what else would cause that in, a, in an eight tower array. Uh, if you hang something on a tower, like an FM antenna for a translator, that changes the, the impedance of the tower and you have to match that. We also did a few tests switching between day and night. Can you walk me through how that works? Whether it's like, is there an engineer that has to come out here every day at the night time and press the button? So, so to switch the towers, this does make it a lot easier when you get to where there's one button to hit. Uh, and it is remotable, so this control panel is remotely controllable and automated so that at night it goes through a sequence, turns off the transmitter, sets the transmitter to the right power level for night, switches all the necessary relays. This gives you an indication that they're all switched good and, and, and they, there's an interlock. If they're not all switched correctly, the transmitter won't come back on, the engineer gets a phone call. In the back of the phaser, there's gargantuan relays, and yes. at the towers, there's gargantuan relays, and there's yeah. lights for all the towers, not just <laughs> a few of them. Yeah. Because yeah. there's only five towers at night, I think, right? And there's yeah. only five during there, the day. Yeah, five at, and five at night. So, so don't those affect the signal? Like if you had a tower that was off and just floating? Yeah. That had so so those are, that's the thing. So the design engineer has to decide out of these towers in day and night how to make them disappear or be there at the right level to help the signal be legal. And so once that's designed, then the, the, the system becomes, get the relays where you need them. So every tower has to be switched in or out of service, either grounded or ungrounded, depending on what the engineer designs. Like we know there's a tower relay in each, for each tower in here, and then there's a relay in each tower. So you've got that many relays getting controlled when you just say, I want to go to night or I want to go to day. And it looks like uh, there's another box here, but it doesn't, it has a cable coming out of it that's a bit smaller than the, the yeah, big Yeah, this, is, this is your lower powered backup. It's a five kilowatt Nautel. That could be very old. I don't know how old this one is, but uh, they're very reliable, super reliable transmitters. And my guess is this was in service before ABC Disney converted this site to 20 kilowatts somewhere around the year 2000. Swinging over here, there's another gargantuan box from Continental. I thought yes. it was a transmitter because it does have a big pipe coming into it, yep. but there's no pipe coming out of it. No, you can see it has no buttons, knobs, or anything to look intelligent, so it's probably a dummy. So, <laughs> so that's why so they call it a dummy load because it only has load. one gauge on it? All it can do, it's yeah, it just has it put me power in me and I will heat up hot and you have to blow air out. This is this one just blows air out the top. And but what's inside there. of this thing? Well, there's a ton of resistors, and uh, they're arranged in a way where the total load right there is 50 ohms. Yep, yeah. big blower, bunch of resistors, a little tuning stuff because it's an AM. It's but it just gets hot and blows air up. Yeah. Before we move on from the dummy load though, there were a couple weird things like the, the back of it had insulation that looked like it had some scorch marks. And also there were air fresheners everywhere and we wanted to know more about that. So we actually got the engineer Aaron Cox to come out to the studio and talk about those things. Well, yeah, when I bring my wife there, she says that it you know smells like kind of musty <laughs> and it's not real pleasant. No, um, actually I did the unthinkable and I, kept a dummy load engaged with the power from a transmitter right into it with the fan not blowing. So over about two hours time after I remotely turned that transmitter on, all the resistive trays in there started to collapse on top of themselves, made a really bad burning smell that took about a year to get out. So, But, but a wonderful learning experience. Yes, absolutely. If you're going to uh, do something remotely, just make sure you've got all the remote capability you can. Cameras are awesome at transmitter yes. sites. Yes. And then the other feature that I've seen, I, I know at the Super Tower, a lot of people commented like, oh, look at all those box fans and the little you know, Walmart fans and things. <laughs> Seems like every tower site has one, but I noticed that uh, at this tower site, they were like zip tied in place really permanently, which was much nicer than most box fan setups I've seen. What? Why? Why are there fans up in, in the ceiling area? I guess at some point in time that there was a air movement issue. Um, the whole system used to have more components on top of the phaser mm -hmm. and it obstructed the airflow from the air conditioning units. The supply and the return was blocked. So 
what a cheap alternative than to put, you know, four or five box fans up in the ceiling. It wasn't just to make sure that if there's another fire, it blows it out into the <laughs> intake or something. Yeah, future fires, we'd like all the smoke expelled as quickly as possible with as many box fans as possible. I also asked him if he's worried about the towers being stolen, since they do have eight of them and, you know, people are stealing them nowadays. You know, not until recently I've ever uh, really feared a tower just being gone, but... You know, I've learned that anything is possible these days. So, um, you know, we put them all under lock and key now, little inventory tags, so that if they show up on eBay, we can identify it easily. Um, although I'm, I want to know uh, how easy it is to transport 200 feet of steel tower. And at every tower site we come to, there's always a rack like this. Although yeah. this one is really nice. Like, it, it's very it's, well organized. Yeah. Can you explain everything going on in here? Well, you, you know, th these racks at a tower site, are the place where we gather and monitor. So we gather all our signals from anywhere, we send them where they need to go, and then we monitor everything. So you've got, you've got everything here, you've got your audio processing is in at this site, is here. There's ways to do that differently now. You've got remote control, um, we've got EAS out here. And then uh, you've got, this is a switcher for doing something out here, monitor, switching, control switcher, satellite receiver, site computer, UPS, the big dog. We, want, we love UPSs. That's what keeps us on the air. Yeah, so. notice there's a whole UPS in that rack over there. It doesn't seem like that one has much. Yeah, that one on looks it. it looks a little lonely. <laughs> so I'm guessing it was the rack, equipment, UPS for that, which is very good and typical because you never know what you're going to end up putting in here. Yep. So they've got a UPS and a UPS, and this is more remote control equipment to uh, get the monitoring equipment that's here. I remember I was looking around. I don't see any, uh, there's power input here but I didn't see a generator. I thought, does every radio station have to have backup power and 24-7 emergency, or is that no, just KMOX? No, you, you, don't, you don't have to. It, it is another uh, statement that you make about how long you want to be on or off the air when you have a power outage. So if you're in an area that has incredibly great power, safe, it feels great, multiple inputs, you might rely on the, on the company and not maintain a generator. Uh, or if you're so like KMOX, part of the EAS national distribution, PEP station, or whatever the new name is for PEP station. Um, if you're part of that, you may do it just because of that, or you might get government funding to do it because of the necessary uh, activity that they want you to be able to maintain. And can you tell me a little bit about grounding in this building? I see a lot of copper straps everywhere. And yeah, I so remember you, at KMOX you said the whole building was kind of like a giant Faraday cage. Yeah, the, yeah, here you can see they've got the ground coming in. So there's grounds here that go around. There's probably a ring outside, uh, uh, ground rods. The ground rods come into the different uh, uh, points for distribution. And you can see the copper strap. The copper strap comes off of this one and uh, goes to the racks, goes to the transmitter in the back. Can you see that? Uh, transmitter in the back and that's probably what happens along the other side too so that there's see there's grounding that goes up on the wall back there and straps into the ceiling yeah oh yeah cable. the ground up there so why why do you need to ground everything so much well energy we want control of energy and we want safety so you got two things for grounding and uh the the ones here these are this is about getting all the towers all of the transmitter equipment, transmitting equipment, all starting at the same ground, the same reference, so that the signal has the best chance to be the most perfect signal. And then there's other grounds, like for these boxes, that are safety grounds. And ultimately, they could share the same point in a building like this with the electrical ground. It, it's such a good ground. It's probably got 10 rods put out in different places around. I've seen five or six of the big boards here. So while we were talking about the grounds, I noticed some weird things. It looks like a bunch of candles up here. Yes. What are those things? These are insulators. So you got a bolting place. You can mount this on something and then you can run the high voltage to here to the next point to the next point. Or you take two of them and you can mount a capacitor across and you keep them uh, isolated in a way so they don't have the arcing. It doesn't go on or doesn't create coronas. Uh, keep them clean because dust can make trails and you can have weird stuff. that. Huh. And there's all kinds of crazy things down here. What, what are those these weird, are capacitors. What are those weird balls? Uh, that is a, these look like pass-throughs. So this is a pass-through. This will pass through, you know, you put one, one on one side of a wall, one on the other, air gap in the middle, and you can pass through this. I, this one, I'm not sure what exactly is passing through or why. Somebody might know. It might be a part of an old transmitter. 
looks it goes to the resistor makes you wonder if it's part of the uh system down here <laughs> oh, these yeah. are old resistors from the uh the dummy load dummy load i'm guessing so you can see they're big old fellas this is a uh, vacuum cap and it's variable it's got a knob on it so some of those knobs when you're turning on that uh, front panel you're actually turning a knob that adjust the, the amount of plate how deep the plates go together inside of that cap uh, in a vacuum and what about this guy uh yeah this guy is chai and coffee stuff like that that's when when it's on does, you does probably every tower have, site have one of these on hand no they don't but you're probably having a bad day if you have to use this more than once at a tower site <laughs> And then a lot of people ask about the copper pipes, thinking they're waveguides or water pipes. Yeah. But they're not. Can you can you no. uh, quickly walk through like what is what are all these things? How does yeah, that so work? Yeah. So we oops. So we've got a piece. You can see a piece here. That's going to be a coax cable, right? Basically, it's like a coax, like your TV antenna, a radio antenna at home. Only it's bigger because it handles more power. And they're they're these are designed for 50 ohms. And I, I've seen these bullets. The only time I saw these bullets, I'm pretty sure it might have been the old RCA 51 ohm. Uh, somebody in the comments might help us with that. But th these bullets might have been on 51 ohm cable. What's a bullet? A bullet, it, this is a bullet. It goes inside and it connects. See this one, that's why I think it's not quite the same. This is an angled bullet, but it goes the same thing. Oh no, this is the same size. You're gonna have to cut that out. <laughs> so here's a good example. The bullets. The bullets go to the interconductor, so it, you, you put your other cables on here, this goes on over the top. So that's how you begin to extend your lines, make your elbows. So but that's gonna take a little while. You're not just gonna come out here and pop a little cable in from one No, point. there's a lot, yeah. You're gonna, you're gonna measure and cut, measure twice, cut once. That's, that's a good rule for our broadcasters. And then the cutting tools over the years, I've seen everything from the great band saws, which can be very sweet to cut, to uh, guys wrapping tape around and cutting along that edge and getting it nice and, you know, rolling it out. How do you plan where to put the towers? So the towers, if you, if you look at it, each set of towers for day and night, so there's eight total, but there's five towers for the day pattern, and I believe there's five towers for the night pattern. And so to make the night pattern work, that's how they come out with that odd tower, and that's all about direction. So from the reference tower, which at this site also changes, which is also different than a lot of uh, sites built, the tower, the reference tower to the others, that creates the patterns that you see, depending on exactly where they are as they transmit out. While we were on site recording, we actually saw this guy on horseback riding through the land. And I, I know uh, in our video where we showed what happens when you touch a tower, That's why you don't touch a tower. A lot of people were asking like, why aren't there bigger fences and electric fences or, you know, fences with barbed wire and stuff to protect these towers? Cause they're so dangerous. I mean, there are, they are dangerous, but you have other dangerous things in daily life and there's warning signs on them too. So, and, and these are out in rural parts. It's not like it's next to an elementary school with a lot of kids running around. But anyway, there are other videos like this one showing more about how constructive interference makes phased array antennas directional. So check them out in the description. Thanks to WSDZ and Aaron for allowing us to take the station off the air for a few minutes to get the relay footage and for letting us see the tower site. Next time we'll talk about this new workbench, so make sure you're subscribed.